connect with you all virtually in this strange new world. Uh, I hope that everyone is staying healthy and, and safe during this really unusual time. Um, so my topic today is data science for public policy and social impact. Uh, this is an area within data science that's really near and dear to me. There we go. A little bit about me. Uh, I studied geography in college. I, I did my bachelor's and master's in geography at the University of Miami. And I'm currently based in San Francisco. Uh, I've been working with geospatial data and um, you know, doing, doing a lot of work with both spatial and non-spatial data sets for uh, a little over a decade. And most recently, I was a data scientist on Uber's policy research and economics team. So what makes public policy data science um, unique and what and what is it? So public policy data science is similar to, um, you know, your typical data science and, and what you think of a data scientist doing except instead of focusing in narrowly on science, scientific questions and business questions, uh, public policy data science tends to focus, focus on a broad, a very broad range of social issues uh, that impact the daily lives of community members. And so some of the questions might be, uh, how do policies impact different groups? Um, what are the outcomes of different policies and, and how are they measuring up to the goals that cities and agencies set? Uh, how feasible and expensive are policies to implement? And what are some data-driven insights that uh, would be needed for decision-making? Who does this kind of work? Well, you might be surprised that data science for public policy is done across many sectors and industries. Uh, so this includes academics, public agencies, private companies, journalists, foundations, even citizens uh, do public policy data science. To give you some examples, um, from MIT public policy data science hackathons to dedicated university departments, such as Carnegie Mellon's new team, um, they're doing really interesting work combining machine learning, information systems, and working together with their public policy departments. You may have heard of organizations like Code for America and think tanks like the Brookings Institution. Even journalists at the New York Times are publishing data-driven deep dives into really important policy issues. Um, one of my favorites is their uh, blog, The Upshot, uh, which if you haven't read it, I would highly encourage you to check it out. And then of course, there are the very talented data journalists at 538. And then there are companies like Uber that have internal research teams like the team that I worked on. So what tools do data scientists and public policy use? Um, chances are, if you're a data scientist on this call, you share a very, very similar toolkit. Um, so here are some of the usual suspects. They include things like Python, R, SQL, um, if you've worked with spatial data, you might be familiar with PostGIS and QGIS. Uh, and then add some curiosity and, and common sense into the mix, and you've got a public policy data scientist. And while this isn't really unique to the realm of public policy, uh, spatial data and analysis plays a very important role. Uh, and so what I'll do next is I'll give you a couple of examples so you can get a better sense of why spatial matters and why I'm bringing it up. So when I was working on Uber's policy research and economics team, I, I was asked to essentially look into the impacts of a new dockless bike share system on transportation equity. Um, I knew that geographic equity would be a really, really good place to start. Um, and using jump bike share data combined with uh, public data sources such as GTFS and census data, uh, as well as open data from other bike share systems, it was possible to start to identify those areas where dockless bike share systems are filling in gaps um, and where other transportation alternatives are limited or unavailable. Uh, so the maps that you see on the screen here 
do just that for Washington, D.C. So for each row, what you can do is you can read this from left to right, where the left map shows the existing transportation alternatives, including dock, uh, docked bike share down at the bottom and transit at the top. And the middle map shows where the dockless bike share system is being used. And, and you can see all of the user activity by those red dots. And then the map all the way on the right is kind of like the, the cookie cutter inversion of that. So it's areas where bike share is being used or um, it's, it's areas where dockless bike share is being used that have limited access to other alternatives such as docked bike share and transit. And so these are essentially the areas where transportation gaps are being filled. Uh, an analysis in San Francisco shows a very, very similar pattern. And again, from left to right, uh, we can see where transit and docked bike share are available. And then also where dockless bike share is being used and then where the gaps are being filled, which are shown in yellow. And while dockless bike share, it won't serve all of the travel needs across the board. Uh, we can see using these maps where they're contributing new alternatives where they're needed the most. To give you another example, um, this is a, a bit of a, a shift from the last example. Uh, spatial analysis was used to understand the impacts of a new transit line in India um, on Uber activity. And what this map shows is the existing transit system in Delhi. Uh, and that's represented by the black lines on the map and then a new line south of Delhi in a city called Gurgaon, and, and the new line is shown in blue. You can see it down at the bottom in sort of the southwest quadrant of the map. This is a heat map that was showing where Uber activity was being used to access that terminus section um, station of the new transit line. And the darker the red, the more trips originated from that area. So you can really start to see where the connections between Uber rides and the new transit line were taking place. And this chart shows the volume of Uber rides to that station before and after the station opening. And after the station opening, we can see a very clear increase in rides. And that gave us a really good signal that riders in this area are using Uber as a first and last mile mode. Um, and this, the, the policy relevance here is that a lot of agencies and cities were interested in if and how Uber interacts with public transit and where there might be opportunities to strengthen those links and mitigate any potentially negative impacts. Um, the tricky part with any sort of analysis that we do around transit is that um, you know, you can look at an area around a transit station and look at pickups and drop offs of rides, but it's not always clear to tell is someone actually getting picked up and dropped off from the transit station or something nearby. Uh, transit stations tend to be in very dense areas where there's lots of other places that people might want to go. Um, and so when a new station opens or a new line opens, it gives us a chance to do something like a natural experiment uh, to see how if there's any significant change in activity and, and that gives us a much better signal. So hopefully um, this gives you an idea and, and while public policy isn't always the most obvious use case for data science, um, I hope that this has shown you that it does have a good deal to offer. Um, and what I'll do next is, is I'll give you uh, a bit of background on, and maybe some tips on how to get started if you're interested in, in this kind of work. So as with most data science tasks, it really starts with questions. Um, most importantly, what do you care about? Um, what are aspects of how your city, your state, your country is operating that could be informed and improved with better data insights? And from there, it's, it's good to do some desk research. Uh, what questions have already been asked and where are there gaps? And from there, you can really hone in on your specific question that you want to answer and, and also hunt for data. 
Of course, this isn't the only approach to doing it. Some people like to start the other way around and, and really explore data and then figure out their question from there. Um, so there, there's no right or wrong way to do it, um, but this is just one, one approach. So once you've figured out your question, the next step is where do I find the data? And um, you know there, there are so many data sources out there, sometimes it's hard to keep track of them all. Uh, these are a few that I've used frequently in my work. And you may know of many of these already, uh, and you probably know of a lot others that aren't on this list, but I, I figured it couldn't hurt to share these. Um, and many of them are geospatial and transportation focused. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, there's some really great resources in here, such as the uh, EPA Smart Location Database, which is a nationwide data set that has a lot of data at the census block group level uh, that's really, really useful for any transportation analysis, anything around the built environment. Uh, you've got, of course, OpenStreetMap, uh, which is a, a, a great crowdsourced resource, and then things like the, the general transit feed specification, and then, of course, census and American community survey data. But what do you do if you can't find the data you're looking for? Uh, is it hopeless? Um, remember that question that we asked earlier about finding what you care about? Uh, that means that there's only the tiniest sliver of a chance that answering yes to this question is the right answer. Uh, policy data scientists are gritty. If they don't find their data, um, they'll dig in even further. So where are their gaps? What are the implications of not having good answers to this question? And who could we partner with to solve the problem? OK, so now you've done your analysis and it didn't tell you what you thought it would. Um, should you toss it out? I would argue no. And that's because even having findings that aren't significant matter, and they really add to our understanding of an issue and, and can save other researchers valuable time. So definitely don't toss them out. Uh, and if you're worried that the results will make your boss unhappy, that's okay, too. Uh, the truth is, is much more important. So to sort of wrap this all up, uh, I wanted to do a, a demo and kind of focus on spatial data science. Um, so you have a more concrete example and, and maybe even some code that you can take and, and use later. So let's start with a, a high level concern. I care about walkable, livable streets and easy, equitable access to resources in my city. Um, this is something that is increasingly important, especially as cities start to think about recovery out of, out of this whole pandemic that we're dealing with and, and how to get cities back up and running. Um, so what data could I use to identify areas that could benefit from improvement? My first step was to look for the data. Uh, I wanted to understand where the food resources were in my city, so I went to Data SF. That's the city's uh, open data portal. And I tracked down two data sets. Uh, one was uh, registered businesses, and the other was active businesses. And I needed them both because the registered businesses data set has spatial information linked to it, so I could actually plot it on a map and start to do some spatial analysis. Uh, but the active business locations, um, I would need to understand what registered businesses are active. And, and that data set did not have the spatial information, um, but it did have a common ID, so I could actually link the two data sets together. The nice thing about Data SF is that you can get downloads for spatial data in a variety of different formats. So in this case, I downloaded the shapefile so that I could upload it to a Postgres database through a desktop GIS system called QGIS. Um, and if all of these terms and acronyms sound unfamiliar to you, uh, don't worry. Uh, after this, I'm, I'm going to post this on my GitHub with a README. So then uh, I'll put some links in there as well if you're interested in getting started with open source GIS. Um, the, the tools that I just mentioned, PostGIS and QGIS, are, are excellent places to start. Um, so yeah, in this case, I, I downloaded the shapefile so that I could put it in my Postgres database. 
So my first step was to import the data into the database. And what you see here is a join of the active businesses to the registered businesses. So I could flag which ones were active and, and use those for my analysis. Um, I also transformed the data so that it uses a projected coordinate system. And, and that'll make sense later on in the analysis. My next step was to create a subset of food related businesses that someone would be able to simply walk into and purchase food. Um, this would include restaurants, uh, supermarkets, takeout, um, farmers markets, produce stands, anything like that. Uh, and all of this information was included in the metadata for the open data set, which is great. Um, the other thing I did was I filtered out some food related categories that I, I didn't think really made sense for my analysis. So things like food prep units, uh, caterers and, and school cafeterias. Um, I didn't include those in my analysis. So this is the, the coolest step, I think, of the process, which is that I used a clustering algorithm to identify uh, spatial clusters of food resources. Uh, and I did this using PostGIS. And again, that's a, a spatial function layer that sits on top of Postgres. So if you think of your typical SQL, um, what PostGIS does is it allows you to do joins and things like that that take spatial proximity into account. Um, it's a very powerful tool. So the, the function that I used from PostGIS is a really great function. It's called ST cluster DB scan. And what it lets me do is it, it clusters points that it's based on a, a search radius and a minimum number of points to be included in a cluster. So if you think of um, maybe a, a busy street that has lots of shops and cafes that are within close proximity to each other, um, those would show up as a cluster. And remember when I transformed the projection of the data in the first step, that's so that I could define the radius of the cluster uh, in units that made sense. So in this case, I used um, meters, whereas if I didn't do that projection, I would have had to figure out how to specify that radius in terms of decimal degrees, um, which would have been tricky because I don't really understand I uh, just intuitively how many decimal degrees would be in, for instance, a meter or a foot. Uh, so this is just a handy way to, to make the analysis more understandable. And so in this example, I'm using a radius of 100 meters and I'm, I've set my minimum to five features, uh, but you can try out different thresholds until you find what works. And the next step is probably my favorite. Uh, let's map it out. So here's what we see as the result of the clustering process. Uh, the small blue dots are the individual food resources. So again, that could be restaurants, it could be supermarkets, produce stands, etc. cetera. Um, the light blue diamonds are the uh, low density clusters. So the ones where I just set um, a light threshold of five restaurants or, or shops or other food resources within proximity to each other. But then I ran this algorithm a few times with higher thresholds to get a range of densities from low to high. Um, and what that allowed me to do was to plot out on a map and start to pick out what are the hot spots, um, where are areas where you have a lot of different options in close proximity to each other. Um, and the, these are essentially food rich areas. Uh, and the, they're shown in the map on a range from the light blue to uh, yellow, orange, and red. So this could be a much, much more in-depth analysis. Uh, so for now, I'll um, you know, leave you with some more questions that could be addressed with this data set. Um, for instance, are there sufficient pedestrian mm -hmm. facilities in the area um, with high density food clusters. And, and this is interesting because especially thinking about, um, you know, post COVID as cities begin to open up, uh, a lot of cities are thinking and even actively experimenting with closing their streets uh, so that it's easier for people to walk and bike around. 
And so having this information where there are clusters of areas that people might want to walk to uh, might be useful when cities are thinking about how to prioritize where to put those locations, where to shut down streets to cars, and also where to look for any potential gaps in infrastructure um, that might be improved from um, you know, better sidewalks, better visibility, better lighting, those types of things. Um, it might also be useful for seeing who's within a walkable distance of these areas and, and where are their gaps in access. So if you think of that map, you could see the hot spots. You can also start to see uh, where are the gaps in access, where are the places where people might live far away um, from those food clusters and from a transportation and uh, you know, overall equity perspective, this could be really useful and informative. And from there, of course, as we ask more questions, we might want more data. Um, and so the next, the last question here is just with some additional data, uh, or what would we really need to paint a full picture uh, that could inform city planning and policy? And that's it. I, I think we might have a little bit of time for questions if anyone has them. Yeah. Hey, uh, Amy, this is Arushi. Hello. Thanks for your uh, presentation. I really like your research and how you explained uh, the necessity for uh, data science and like policy. Uh, and I really like the images that you made for uh, one of the articles. And so I was wondering how you got those images. Like, what are the best visualization tools of what you for this? Yeah. Yeah, it was a combination of things. In, in terms of the charts, I usually use R and ggplot. Mm -hmm. um, those are excellent tools for data science and visualization. Um, I would say ggplot, if you never used it, it's just such a great, easy to use visualization tool. And it, it turns out really great visuals. Um, in terms of the spatial data sets, there's a lot of stuff out there. I think, you know, there's some great visual visualization tools for mapping within R and Python. Uh, I prefer to use QGIS, which is an open source desktop mapping software. Um, and it, it's very interactive. So you can load in layers, you can overlay them with each other, you can change the color and, and size and shape really easily. Um, and and I, that's really great. You can also bring in a lot of different uh, base map services um, from different companies that publish them online. Um, so so it's, it's a great tool. In terms of like making everything look nice uh, and shiny at the end, I tend to use uh, Adobe Illustrator just for graphic design and any final touches. Oh, awesome. Yeah, that, that, that's a lot of good work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Thanks for answering my question. Absolutely. Any other questions? No, everybody's very quiet. You can uh, feel free to um, send the question in the chat. And I'll read it out loud. Um, maybe a question for me. Um, uh, what was like one of your like um maybe a few challenges that you had while working with the like location? Anyways, few few challenges that you had um analyzing and how do you solve it? Yeah. Um, in this case, using open data, I would say. Data quality is always the biggest challenge, and, and how do you verify that the data you have is correct? Um, in this case, I put together this example, um, and I, I, to some degree, trusted that San Francisco's open data portal is correct and accurate and up to date. Um, you can see, check the metadata and see um, the dates when things were last uh, updated, and they do keep things pretty up to date. Um, however, when I was looking at the map afterwards, I thought, well, 
some of these businesses might be closed down due to COVID and that might not be reflected in the data set. Um, so if I were to, for instance, take this and take it up kind of like to the next level, my challenge would be, how do I verify the quality of this data and the, and the accuracy for this specific time period? Um, and that would be a, a sort of another data wrangling challenge. That's very interesting. It's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I think probably all of us uh, eventually went through like open data sets and found there's a lot of cleansing that has to be done before. Um, cool. Um, yeah. Anyone else? I have a question for you, Amy. So uh, your your suggestion about using the uh, I think it was QGIS where you that that allowed you to specify the distance to a hundred meters. I believe you said it was, or maybe it was yards. I can't recall. Are there other tricks like that that you found? You know, as a result of your ten years of working with GIS data, that you know those of us that have not worked with GIS data would find useful. That that was a good example. Hmm. Yeah, let me think about that. I think I would encourage you to go to the documentation site for post GIS um, and peruse all of the spatial functions. Uh, there's a lot in there um, from very basic proximity functions, you know, trying to see if points are contained within a boundary or, you know, understanding if two uh, polygon layers intersect with each other spatially. Um, PostGIS can check those kinds of things for you. Um, and then it gets into much more uh, complex algorithms from there, like, like clustering. Um, and there's a, I mean, there's a lot. So I, I would encourage you to check out the documentation. It's, it's really well done. Thanks. Yeah. It looks like we have a question from Katie. Uh, what have been some of your favorite projects to work on? Oh, wow, that's hard to pick. I, I think the, the examples that I gave you um, in Gurgaon and then the, the bike share example are, are definitely pretty high up on the list. Um, another one of my favorites is um, for the past, I would say, three or four years, cities have been thinking more and more about um, how to better curb, manage curb space. Um, as you know, a lot of curb space in the U.S. especially is dedicated to parking. Um, and now, suddenly, with new services like, like Uber and Lyft and micromobility, uh, there's a lot more demand for the curbside than there used to be. Um, and cities, actually Seattle, I would say, is, is really ahead of a lot of cities on this are, are thinking about, you know, could we take out some parking and make it useful for passenger loading and other purposes? Um, and one of the things that I got to work on was helping inform that process. So essentially uh, helping cities hone in on areas with high demand for ride sharing and helping them understand what is the distribution of activity look like by time of day. Um, so a pilot project might be you know designating a section of the curb space for loading only during the busiest times when it's needed and it could be parking for for other times of the day um, so really trying to pull together insights that would be useful for that planning process was really exciting um, it was also a chance to get me away from my computer because i actually got to go out and talk with some of these agencies and cities and it's kind of nice when uh, data scientists get to go outside. <laughs> yeah, that sounds fun. Uh, does the city, uh, did the city councils like reach out to Uber? Like how did it work? Yeah, that's essentially how it would work is, you know, I, I think we heard from Seattle might have been one of the first and, and San Francisco, just agencies that manage that space reaching out to us and saying, hey, we want to try something out. Um, and it actually started to happen 
so often that we ended up forming a partnership with a, a nonprofit organization called Shared Streets um, that essentially built a data sharing platform that would let private companies essentially share their data. Um, they would aggregate all the data and then give cities access to the dashboard so cities could look at the dashboard and get the information that they needed. So um, it sort of automated me out of the process, uh, but it was it was really good um, step, I think, and it made it much easier for us to share data with cities. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, oh, we have another question. Um, I really like the idea of exploring social policies with data. Could you give more examples of similar opportunities, companies slash organization maybe, names maybe? Um, could you repeat the question? Um, Oh, wait, yeah, I can um, see it in my chat. Oh, awesome. <laughs> um, I really like the idea of exploring social policies with data, for example, similar opportunities. Um, yeah, you know, it, I think a lot of companies now are, are thinking about this. And you know, Uber is one example. Um, I think Lyft is another in the transportation space. Um, other companies are, are sharing data. If, if you think of, um, you know, Facebook has, you know, a lot of initiatives around using data for um, social good, for, for helping inform disaster uh, management and, and things like that. Um, I think if others come to mind. Um, oh, well, also um, Google and Apple I believe both shared mobility data sets around COVID um, when that was happening just based on their, their mobile app data. Um, so, so those are two to, to keep an eye on for things like that as well. I hope that helps. Thank you. Yeah. I hope so. Um, yep. Looks like it helps. <laughs> um, all right. Um, well, uh, guess we can uh, keep it short today and uh, go enjoy the sun. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. This was our first online tech talk, and I think it went pretty well. Um, Stay in touch, follow us on Meetup page, and we'll shortly announce the next one, the June Tech Talk. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, we will follow up with the, and share the presentation with the video. And um, yeah, thank you, Amy, very much for joining us from San Francisco. It was a great time. Thank you, thank you. It was, it was really nice to connect with everyone virtually. and. Okay. One day we get to do all of this in person. <laughs> yeah, maybe one day. We all hope so. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank you very much, guys. Have a good evening. Thanks for joining us. Bye.